I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is California's more than $200 billion budget and what it means for you. With us, Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon, one of the key players in negotiations happening right now. Later, United States Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg on infrastructure, vaccines, and Pride Month. Plus, journalist Edward Isaac Dover is with us to talk about his juicy new book that explains what Democrats really say about each other behind each other's backs. The issue is, starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. Tuesday, June the 15th is when California will fully reopen. But it is also the deadline for California to formally pass a budget. The legislature recently passed a $267 billion budget but they are engaged in final negotiations with Governor Newsom over the specifics. Helping to lead those negotiations is our guest this week. He is the Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon. You see him right there and you'll see him now. Speaker Rendon, welcome back to The Issue Is. Good to see you, Alex. Good to be back. All right, so where are we at in the negotiations and what's the biggest sticking point at this point? We're in the home stretch. Uh, really, we're about a week out from having a, a finalized budget. Uh, in terms of sticking points, I think it's really about fine tuning things. Uh, we have more revenue than we thought we'd have. We have a dynamic and responsible budget, has more money set aside for in our rainy day fund than, than ever before. So uh, we're, we're excited about uh, moving forward with, our, with the outline that we have and, and talking to the governor to get his input. Is it a lot more fun doing this when you have that big of a surplus? It's a lot more fun uh, when you have more money to spend. There, are, you know, probably uh, it, it sometimes takes a little bit more work. But yeah, I mean, we we're looking at a situation as recently as September where we thought that we would be in the red uh, this year. To have this surplus is incredible. It's fantastic. Well, let's talk about some of the issues. Homelessness, issue number one for so many people. You're proposing historic spending on homelessness. In the simplest terms, what is your plan to deal with this? Our plan is to make sure that local entities, whether it's city governments or counties, are have the resources that they need to address issues in their own communities. They're the ones who know uh, problem areas and, and how to get people housed. So as you said, we're giving more money. Uh, we're, we're spending more money on homelessness than we've ever spent. We also know we have a problem with housing scarcity. Um, so we're gonna do all we can and make sure that there's more housing online uh, so that uh, we can impact the, the, the law of supply and demand and help to bring down some of the, the prices of housing. All right, let's talk about another issue. There's been a bit of a disagreement between the legislature and the governor over expanding medical insurance for undocumented Californians. Your plan includes health care for low-income undocumented Californians who are over 50. The governor's is over 60. So where are we looking at settling on this? Well, we, you know, we, we again, you know, we, we want to get to 50. We think that's sort of the, an important marker in terms of the demographics. We've kind of looked at the bell curve and where most people uh, fall. These are people who are in this country contributing to our economy. We want to make sure they're healthy. We want to make sure that a lot of the health maladies that they sometimes suffer from, including COVID, uh, where, where this population suffered tremendously, we want to make sure that they get the covered, uh, coverage that they need. That being said, you know, we're talking to the governor and the administration about these issues every day. So you don't have a deal yet on that? No, definitely don't have a deal on that yet, but we anticipate having one by the 15th. And for people that say, look, we have a hard enough time taking care of people that are citizens in this country. We shouldn't be spending money on this. What do you say to them? I'd say regardless of your your feelings about the, the presence of these folks in this country, in this state, they're here. Uh, they're contributing to our economy. They're folks who are working at the at the restaurants you eat at, at the stores you uh, you purchase from. And we want them to be healthy. Uh, on last week's show, we talked with Caitlyn Jenner. It got more reaction than anything we've ever done on the show. I asked her about the size of the budget, which is what you do for a living. Uh, she said she didn't know what it was. And when I asked her about cutting taxes, here's what she said. Do you think that taxes on the rich should be lowered in California? Um, I think it's an issue. I haven't gotten strongly into exactly what we're going to have. So what do you make of her? 
Um, don't know her. And unfortunately, uh, we were dealing with uh, uh, one of our deadlines last week, so I haven't caught the interview yet, Alex. I promise uh, I will catch it. I'm interested in, in, in your reaction to having interviewed her. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Caitlin Jenner. I think if somebody's going to run, uh, run for governor of California and help to to be part of the the team uh, that that uh, that the governance team for the state, I think they ha- ought to have well articulated ideas about policies like uh, like taxation. Uh, and I want to say a programming note next week on the issue is former San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner will be in studio to talk about his plan uh, to run California. We have a lot of different perspectives on this show, and he will be sharing his view. But before we go and before we uh, let you go for this week, we want to play personal issues with you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is where we put 30 seconds on the clock. We ask rapid fire questions. And since we're fully reopening on Tuesday, this is a lot about your post June 15th plan. So. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. So let's put that 30 seconds up and here we go. The thing you are most excited to do first. Uh, Eat Korean barbecue. Where? Anywhere in K-Town. Okay. Sports team you most want to see in person first. Oh, Dodgers. We've talked about this for sure. Concert you most want to go to. Uh, There's a band I've been listening to. They're an LA band, uh, Lord Haran. Um, they're kind of a local hipster band. Uh, they're, they're great live. I'd like to see them again. And a favorite book you read in quarantine? Oh, I read a lot. Uh, probably DJ Waldy's book, uh, Becoming Los Angeles. Fantastic, fantastic read. Would you describe yourself as a local hipster? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm too old to be a hipster. <laughs> All right. Well, we appreciate you getting into that kind of music. Uh, in that spirit, and this is not hipster music, we end with Don Henley's Boys of Summer uh, because uh, people are excited to get outside and it feels like uh, things are changing for the better. Uh, Speaker Rendon, thanks for coming on and have a great summer. Thanks, Alex. Up next, the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, talks California and infrastructure. Stay with us. You're watching The Issue is. While President Biden is out of the country, his team back home is working with Congress on the issue of infrastructure. One of the key cabinet officials leading those discussions is Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. We spoke with him earlier this week. We've reached the point where we need to pursue multiple pathways to get this done. U.S. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg is a key player in the room for negotiations over President Biden's more than $2 trillion infrastructure bill. This week, the White House called off talks with Republican Senator Shelley Moore Capito, but continued talks with other Republicans. Do you think that the Republicans are negotiating in good faith, or do you think they're just trying to run out the clock? You know, there's been a lot of goodwill in honest, frank uh, negotiations where sometimes we, we turn out just to be too far apart. And so that's what happened with the group uh, that the president was uh, speaking with earlier. There are other groups forming uh, different combinations of Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate. And it's absolutely worth pursuing that track. The White House says California's infrastructure gets a C minus grade and has more than 1,500 bridges and 14,000 miles of road that are poor quality. California, you got it all, right? You got ports and airports, you got uh, a waterfront and desert, you you got uh, uh, roads and rail and transit and everything in between, rural and urban. And it's exactly why we need a plan like this that doesn't nibble around the edges. I asked about California's struggle to build high-speed rail on budget and on time. What do you say to people who don't necessarily trust that the government does this well? America doesn't have a lot of batting practice when it comes to true high-speed rail. And California has stepped forward to be one of the first places doing it uh, in, in full in the U.S. And, and that's had a lot of challenges. Uh, but what we can't do is somehow accept the idea that America should settle for less. Uh, the president believes America should be number one in the world. We also talked about the Biden administration's push to vaccinate Americans via record incentives. Budweiser offering free beer. United free flights. Microsoft, free Xboxes, and California, $1.5 million. We know that you are already vaccinated, but if you weren't already vaccinated, what would be the prize that would excite you the most? 
<laughs> well, the, the free beer sounds pretty good to me. So uh, I guess uh, a little easier to win me over than a, a million dollar lottery. Apparently you're a cheap date, which, which sounds good. Uh, <laughs> to, to, to I'm not point, such though, a good negotiator. I could have had a million bucks <laughs> and you had me a beer. Congratulations, Mr. Secretary. Congratulations. So Buttigieg is one of America's first openly gay cabinet secretaries, now serving during LGBTQ Pride Month. What does pride mean to you? Well, uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm thinking about the journey we've been on. Uh, you know, not that long ago, uh, somebody who was out uh, would have been unimaginable as a cabinet officer uh, or, you know, even as a federal employee. We've got a long way to go, but what pride means to me is uh, uh, that there, there really is a chance to stand up for each other in the name of compassion, uh, in the name of equality, and make life better. And uh, my being here uh, is uh, one small piece of evidence of that. And I know there are a lot of young people out there wondering whether they fit. Uh, they know they're different, and they don't know whether America has a place for them. Uh, and I'm here to say that uh, there's a lot of people rooting for you. A beautiful sentiment to end on. Our thanks to Secretary Pete. He is a key player in a juicy new book written by my next guest. But as we go to break, the Secretary's favorite band right now, Radiohead. girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools and she was bused to school every day and that little girl was me that was one of the most contentious moments of the entire 2020 campaign for the Democratic nomination we're now getting an inside look at what really happened there behind the scenes and a whole lot more in a blockbuster new book Let's show it to you. It is called Battle for the Soul, Inside the Democrats' Campaigns to Defeat Trump. It is by Edward Isaac Dover. It is one of the best-selling books in all of politics, and he joins us now. Welcome to The Issue Is for the very first time. Thanks. I the first time here, but not first time I've watched, so it's great to be here. Uh, thank you very much. And for some background on him, by the way, uh, he is a staff writer at The Atlantic and former senior White House correspondent at Politico and one of the, the, the best plugged in people in all of politics and, and shameless plug. I read the book. I love the book. This is one of the best books on politics in terms of taking you in the room that I've read in a really long time. So if you're into this sort of thing, highly recommend it to our audience, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Um, so let's start, Thanks though, with that, that title, uh, Battle for the Soul. You talk about this challenge between moderates, progressives, trying to figure out where do we go? How do we fight Donald Trump? And where does the party go from here? What do you mean when you say Battle of the Soul? It ended up being uh, battles for the souls, almost. There's so much that went into this campaign uh, in the end. And when when I started out to write this book, it was in 2018. I thought it was going to be the craziest election, the mo maybe the most important election in American history. I had no sense that the pandemic was coming, the economic crisis, the rethinking of work and school, uh, the rethinking of everything in our society. I didn't know that George Floyd was going to be killed in that way. Uh, I didn't know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was going to die. All of these things that set off major changes in America and that made it so that when America voted last year for president, they were making a really big decision, the voters. But I would say uh, one of the things that sets this book apart, it is not another Trump book. There are a lot of Trump books out there. This is covering things that you haven't seen elsewhere and haven't read about elsewhere. Well, and one of those things, or a lot of those things, involve former President Barack Obama. And one of the things that I didn't know was that his first choice for president was not Joe Biden, and it's not somebody a lot of people think of. And there's a scene in the book in the end of 2017 where he playing a game and he says to some of his aides, who do you want in your head, who do you want in your heart, and who do you think can win? And in his heart, he says Biden. But in his head, he says Bill McRaven, the uh, commander of the Navy SEAL raid that, that killed bin Laden, uh, which was a, he wasn't the only one thinking that. I had heard other people saying, hey, maybe that's the statesman choice to come out of the Trump years. That's what we need to do. But then when he got to the question of who could win, he said, I don't know. And he had some choice language that we see in the book that we have not seen uh, publicly, some of the ways he described Donald Trump. Yeah, and look, as a reporter, as you know, 
if you can ever find an example of a politician cursing, it's great because you know that you're getting the unvarnished, raw feeling of what happened. So when he is watching, for example, uh, news reports that Donald Trump is talking to foreign leaders without aides on the phone, has the Russian ambassador into the Oval Office without anybody else in there, what, the way that it comes out of him at one point is that corrupt mf -er, but he doesn't say mf -er, he says the full word. I won't uh, subject myself to the bleeping. Uh, and that's how, he, that's how frustrated he was yeah. by what was happening. We need an HBO version just to do uh, this book <laughs> justice, because there are a lot of people that curse throughout it. And speaking of that, there's a scene of Kamala Harris talking about her role as a prosecutor in California with some more choice language. Yeah, this is a scene uh, that it, it goes to the meeting that uh, she had with her staff uh, at her sister's apartment building in New York City, actually, uh, in the summer of 2018, when they were deciding, is she going to run for president? And her brother-in-law, Tony West, her sister Maya's husband, uh, goes after her with everything that he can think of to, go at, uh, to, to bring up that would be a problem for her. And key to that is criticizing her record as a prosecutor from when she was in San Francisco and even when she was AG, saying you betrayed uh, black people, you did all these things that were so terrible, you put a lot of people in jail, and really trying to go after as hard as he can imagine someone would on the campaign trail. And Harris looked at it, and at that point, she responds, she, she sort of cocked her head like this, is the way it's been described to me, and she says, yeah, I, I locked some MFers up, but again, she uses the full word. When she says it, I don't think most people know this, she's actually very deliberate, and she'll correct people's pronunciation of that full word if they say it with the R's. She likes to end with the ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, so uh, you're, the viewers can put together what I'm saying. <laughs> well, let's get into the, the Biden-Harris relationship. We were just looking at some clips of that debate, and, and another swear word, I guess, is Joe Biden. Uh, after that moment where Kamala Harris uh, basically attacked tax him over busing. He turned to Pete Buttigieg and described the scene, and it also sort of changed the relationship between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for a while. And, and you're going to make everybody think that it's all curse words, but there are uh, <laughs> 500 pages of material. Yeah. This is another one of those moments, right? Because what happens is she says uh, a phrase that had been worked out by her campaign, which is, I know you're not a racist. Uh, and that and the attack overall really lights Biden up. He turns to Pete Buttigieg, whom at that point he didn't know at all. Uh, and, uh, and as they go into the commercial break and he says, oh, that was some effing BS. Again, not the full <laughs> words. Uh, um, but, uh, and then it carries forward. They were so angry about it, the Biden folks. Uh, and then there's a phone call that's reported in the book of uh, Jill Biden talking to some donors and supporters and uh, she is so angry about it. And she says to stand up there and call him a racist with everything that he's done, the life that he's led, the work that he's put in, uh, go after yourself. Uh, so are, are the two. But, but I, I should say they've worked it they've out. They've worked it out, clearly. She's now the vice president of the United States and, and a pretty visible vice president of the United States. Up next, inside Joe Biden's first interview in the Oval Office as president. And it was with our guest, Isaac Dover. We are back with the author of Battle for the Soul, an extraordinary book about democratic politics, Edward Isaac Dover. You uh, had a, a real exclusive, which is the, the first interview with Joe Biden in the, in the um, Oval Office as president. What was that experience like, and, and where would you describe his mindset right now? Okay, so I should say he was in the Oval Office. It was still, it was the very beginning of February. So I was over the phone um, and I wanna misrepresent what happened uh, because of the COVID restrictions still. I think what you see out of Biden now as president is a level of control of himself. He's not, there aren't a lot of moments where he's like blabbing and saying things, going off script, uh, in part because his staff has kept him very much uh, on, on the ball and, and not doing a lot of just freewheeling moments. And in part because there's a sense of confidence that is coming off of him that I could feel in that interview and that other people that I've talked to have said to me they felt uh, as well. This is a man who uh, literally for longer than I've been alive has been thinking about running for president. He, uh, he got to be president despite a lot of people doubting that he could. Right. And when we were talking at one point, he pointed to the uh, painting of FDR that he had hanging over the fireplace in the Oval Office, that prime spot. That's the North Star that he's using now. It's not uh, just small ball business that he's interested in. And I know as journalists, you're never supposed to make predictions and people that have 
usually get in trouble. But if you had to bet, would you bet that he runs again? It's a really hard thing to say. He says he's going to run. Um, he would be 82 at that point. He would be the oldest president to run for re-election. He was already the oldest president to be elected. Talk to people close to him, and they say he is running yeah. for sure. But, you know, a lot of things uh, change, and uh, who knows? Well, Lyndon Johnson was running for president uh, in 1968 until he wasn't, right? Yeah. Uh, and That's, uh, that is so that we'll is see. a better political answer than most of the politicians uh, give. So <laughs> I like that you gave yourself a lot of wiggle room there. All right. We play games on this show. This one's kind of All fun. Right. It's called the name game. It's going to get to the heart of the key players in the 2020 race. One word that comes to mind to describe each of them. All right. Let's start with Joe right. Biden. Uh, deep feeling. That's sort of hyphenated. Kamala Harris. And uh, determined. Bernie Sanders. Committed. Elizabeth Warren. That's a tough one. Uh, uh, cerebral. Pete Buttigieg. Analytic. Cory Booker. Uh, emotional. Andrew Yang. Curious. And we'll see if mayor is going to be the word to describe him soon. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you so much for the perspective. We always like to play music on this show, so we are ending with some music from Bruce Springsteen. We take care of our own, which played many, many times on the campaign trail uh, on it's, 2020, it's even, if it was, my brain. even if it was virtual. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're hearing that as we go to break. Congratulations on the book. Again, Battle for the Soul. Buy this. It's great. You're a fantastic writer, and we hope you'll uh, come back and join us again sometime soon. Love to do it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I've heard the, the first 30 seconds of this song mm, a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we take care.